maths here and I'm very glad to see such a good turnout to our maths pathway information evening. So welcome, uh, this is Joel Smith who is a representative from Maths Pathway and is going to do a demonstration of how it works and we'll be happy to field questions afterwards. Because we are recording this we will be using a um, microphone for the people who are unable to be here. So if you're sitting in this area here, um, beware that uh, you, if you turn around you'll be recorded on our video. So if you want to move, now is the chance. Okay, take it away. Thank you. Is that working? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so as, as well said, my name's Joel. Um, but actually rather than uh, kind of straight into a demonstration, what I uh, tend to do when I come and kind of give a first impressions, first look at Matt's pathway kind of talk, is uh, start with something more aligned to why bother, why, why do this and why, why do Matt's when you've been doing so far. Um, and there are all, there's always opportunity for me to demonstrate what I'm saying on, on the screen, which is attached to my laptop here, um, but otherwise I'll just let people's questions uh, drive what I talk about beyond that. Um, so as I said, I'm Joel, and I really like Matt's. I hope I have some company in the room. Well, I have some of the maths faculty here, so I should. Um, Sorry, Joel, can you swap mics, please? Swap mics? All right. One, two, three, is that better? Yeah. Okay, great, fantastic. Um, and I really like maths. Uh, I was successful in it in school. I felt really good about myself when I was, when I was doing well in maths, um, and that led me to continue on to do a Bachelor of Science at Melbourne University, which then fed into a Master's in Particle Physics, and then I realised that research is not what I want to do, as I had a very narrow ability range that I had to find somewhere to apply, um, and I moved into education. Um, and largely because uh, a, a good example of, of kind of why, why I bothered was that my fiancé considers herself naturally bad at maths. And I actually don't think that's an inherent property of people, that they're naturally good or bad at maths. I'm not going to sit here and debate that. I'm sure other people would side with Katie and my fiancé in that argument. Um, but I think just like most things, it's a learned skill. And the reason people consider themselves to be um, either inherently good or bad at maths is dependent on whether they felt successful in it in school. And so uh, throughout my kind of little spiel here, I'm going to ask for people to put up their hands only once will I ask for elaboration from a few people, uh, and then the rest of the time, I'm just, just kind of like poll. Uh, so please be forthcoming with your hands. I'll look like an idiot. Um, and I promise only once uh, will I ask for volunteers, and then, then from then we're done, then we're done. Um, so I want, I want to talk about what other people are good at. I said I was good at maths. Um, I want, to think, want you to think about what you're good at. So can everyone just take a few seconds in their mind think about something that they're good at? It might be a hobby that you have, it might be that you're a particularly good driver, I know everyone thinks they're a good driver, but surely some people are. Um, it might be something that you do at work that nobody else can do right. Um, take a moment, get it in your mind. Okay, does anyone want to share the thing that they're good at? Mm, thank you. Photography, great. Any other examples? Yes? Talking. Talking, good. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes? Organizing. Organizing, a skill I lack. Yeah. Art and design. Art and design, fantastic. All right. And so we've got a few examples, but I want everyone in the room to at least have something in their mind. That's it, that was the one. I didn't even ask for hands, actually. I just, I just want everyone to think about the thing. And I've called for volunteers, that's it. Uh, I want you to think about how you got good at the thing that you're good at. And now I'm going to ask for hands, but no, no one's going to have to say anything. Uh, I'm going to take a quick poll. And so, hands up. Did anybody here get good at the thing they're good at uh, through attending lectures? Actually, that helped me. Now, really often I get a, a couple. Yeah, okay, good. There's one right here. Um, did anybody get good at the thing they're good at through the help of a mentor of some kind? Yeah, there's always a few. Um, who got good at the thing they're good at uh, through practice? Good. Yeah, right? And there's, there's often overlap between those hands, obviously. Uh, but it has to be the right practice. And math, math is no exception to this. Uh, but the problem that a teacher faces in, the, in a classroom is that they have, uh, let's, let's pick a number for a standard classroom, maybe 20 students. 
uh, who all need different, the different level of practice uh, at the same time. So I want you to think back to your own school and get hands up, no volunteers. Uh, and can you remember a time that the teacher was up the front of the class and they were explaining something on the whiteboard. We'll go with the maths classroom in your mind, because that's going to be the theme of tonight. Um, and you thought to yourself, I already know this. I am so bored, um, and I, I, this, is, this is child's work, this is baby stuff. Uh, who's thought that at some point when they're back in their own school? Oh, that's for students, great. Any adults with their hands up in there? Yeah, good, there's, there's been a few. Who, uh, as a contrast, uh, remembers a time, actually my hand goes up there as well. Who, as a contrast, remembers a time that the, a teacher was up the front of the class and the opposite was happening? Uh, you know, they may as well have been speaking French. Unless, of course, you speak French. Okay, great. Uh, and it's, exact, it's exactly the same for students. Uh, but let's, let's think about why, why it is. And a good analogy that I like to use for that is to picture maths as a brick wall. It's pretty, pretty simple to grasp, really, is that on the very bottom layer, you've got your you know, foundation level maths, you've got place value, you know, why is 110 and 2 ones the number 12, uh, you've got really basic addition, you might have uh, the names of some shapes, um, and then as you build up, you get into things like column multiplication, you know, 24 times 312, those kind of things, um, and calculating perimeters of things, and then you come up into, into secondary maths, and you start getting into the beginnings of algebra, uh, you move up even further into, into later secondary maths, and you get into the beginnings of Calculus and actually kind of surface area is the geometry aspect of that. If you're interested in probability, which is very rare among students, um, you get into things like commutations and permutations, really interesting stuff. Uh, and then if you go above that, you get into tertiary mathematics, and you've got, uh, you know, I'm still building layers, I stopped, I stopped doing the little thing, but I'm still building layers here. We've got tertiary mathematics, uh, where you've got things like fluid dynamics and and uh, if anyone here ever has the opportunity to study group theory, don't, it's genuinely not very useful, but it's interesting at the very least. Um, and the, kind of the problem with a kind of old school, you know, what, what used to be done classroom of teaching everybody the same thing at the same time, is that regardless of what that brick wall looks for any given student, and I'll talk about why it might look the way it will look in a second, um, is that Depending on their age, we put another clean layer right on top of, of any kind of wall, but maybe full of gaps. Um, can anyone here, again, hands up, but no volunteer, can anyone here think of a time that they've been, been helping their child with maths, or been asked to help their child with maths, and you've had a look at the question, you thought, I have seen this, but it's gone. It's totally gone. I know I did it, and at one point I could have done this, but it's gone. Who remembers that feeling? Yeah, you've seen it, you've seen it. Uh, and it's the same students. That's the reason that there are you know, gaps in these brick walls. For, for whatever reason, students either have forgotten something or never understood it correctly in the first place. It might be that they were uh, particularly unwell for a while and missed a whole lot of class. I remember when I was growing up, my sister had glandular fever and that affected her, her results quite, for quite a while. Um, when I, sorry, it might be that, um, what else could there be? Maybe one year they had a class or a teacher that they just didn't gel with as well as they could have. Through no, through no fault of anybody's in these situations, there's gaps in, in every student's learning, and they're all different. Um, and a standard putting a clean layer on the top of that brick wall is an approach that it's kind of easy to see why, why it doesn't work, um, but it's hard to find a practical solution to, to have essentially every student with a different brick wall full of different gaps working on something different. Um, so the best way to kind of explain what Matt's Pathway schools do to tackle that is to talk about the genesis of it. Uh, so, so Matt's Pathway was started, um, well actually kind of we consider our birthday to be a bit over three years and that was the point at which a couple of us were working full time out of a shed. Um, prior to that there were a few years of, of development um, uh, by the two founders, Richard and Justin, who taught through the Teach for Australia program, if anyone knows it here, puts um, puts recent graduates of non-teaching professions through a, an intensive course, um, and then they get the rest of the training kind of on the ground in socioeconomically disadvantaged schools. It's a good way to get professionals in schools quickly, and they get the teaching degree on the fly, effectively. Um, and they managed to kind of you know, get permission and be able to implement a very different learning model by hand. Uh, and I stress by hand because a lot of teachers have tried this uh, and run out of steam very quickly, which is what they did as well. Um, so they would start by 
in a class of 20 students, diagnosing, I'm going to step around a little bit, it's why I'm way over in the corner at the moment, so it helps me keep track of where I am. Um, you know, they started by diagnosing every student really granularly uh, across the entire Australian curriculum. Not in one gargantuan test, that would be not sensible, um, but in, in a systematic, sensible way, doing it gradually. Um, they got data on every single student, what they could do and what they couldn't do. Uh, and they recorded it in just way too many Excel spreadsheets, and you know, they're very good with Excel, which is handy. Uh, but off the back of that really granular data, um, in the kind of work part of class, effectively you might call it, um, every student got the work that was right for them. It depended on what their brick wall looked like, what their, what their gaps were, they would get the right work for them, which for the teacher involved a whole lot of, you know, finding the right resources and doing the photocopying and making sure everyone had the right stuff, um, and who would still get the attention they needed when they were stuck. Uh, it's a lot of work. Uh, but at the end of every two weeks, really regularly, so that they could keep that kind of data that they put together here up to date, because it's no longer the same when students are learning new things, um, they would have a test. Uh, and every student's test would be different. It would be individual to them, and would be based on the work that they, doing, that they were doing in this part. It makes no sense to give everybody the same test if they're all doing different things. Uh, and then off the back of that, um, it's probably the most impactful part of this whole four little sideways step cycle, uh, which is feedback with the student on how they're doing, um, not just in terms of the maths, oh, you didn't understand adding fractions, let's go over it, but rather, why is it that we've done adding fractions and you don't understand it now? Um, there's something wrong with the learning process, not with you and, and your ability to understand adding fractions. Um, perhaps we didn't check our answers as we go. We went, perhaps, perhaps we thought we knew it. Um, it's very difficult to be able to assess yourself on whether you know something or not, but it's a skill that can be learned. Um, and off the back of that, that test as well, they'll update all of those spreadsheets that were over here and start again. Uh, and it worked fantastically. Uh, the students were showing amazing growth. They were, they were learning a lot of maths really quickly, um, but Richard and Justin, these two founders, looked like pandas. You know, just constant bags under the eyes, and I often get teachers say, yeah, I can imagine, because maybe over the two-week holiday break, they'll manage to plan three weeks ahead at most, because this data is always changing, right? Um, and then by week four, at the latest, they're just scrambling to keep up for the rest of the term again in terms of planning. And one of them, Richard, uh, has a background in software engineering, amongst other things, an interesting guy. Um, and kind of like a bad infomercial said, well, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be some way that we can remove all of, all of the time-consuming work, which is the, you know, finding the right resources, photocopying, distributing the right people, updating those Excel spreadsheets. It's tedious. I shouldn't have to do that myself. Um, and, and there wasn't anything that would take care of that for them. Because what they wanted to spend their time doing uh, was essentially the, the fun and most impactful part of being a teacher, which is working with small groups or, or individuals <coughs> Um, and targeting their instruction at them. And you know, they have the data on what that student's ready to learn. They get a really high value out of one-on-one -on -one or one-on-three time with students who are, who are in a similar place or have a similar gap in their brick wall. Um, and so they, they gradually scaled down their own teaching and scaled up uh, building what is now a maths pathway. And they, they tried it in a couple of classrooms uh, of their own originally, and it was terrible, it was really bad. They got a lot of feedback from teachers, students, Parents, thank you, I'm really hot actually. <laughs> um, they got a lot of feedback from, from parents, students, teachers, you know, from the teachers, it was, it was along the lines of, well, we need this data if we're going to be able to, you know, focus our efforts accurately. And from students, it needs to be pretty effectively. Um, and, and, you know, from parents, they want to know what's going on. They want to be able to easily understand, it should not be in teacher speak and, and things like this, right? Um, and so they iterated and they, they went again, and it was a little bit less terrible, uh, but still, still really not what it should be. But now it's been, it's been three years, um, and there are close to 100 schools using Maths Pathway, and they're doing really, really well. And by really, really well, what I mean is that students are, on average, uh, learning between, around about one and a half years of maths every year. Uh, and that, that, that's what we call growth. I mean, we could have arbitrarily called it progress or, or something else, really. Um, but we tend to call it growth. And it's what's represented up on the screen by a little rocket near the top right, and a little 133% symbol, um, what that is, is this student's growth rate, or growth score, kind of whatever you want to call it really, just growth is, is important. Um, and what it says is, really, I don't care what you do and don't know, and kind of what level you're at. What I care about is, are you learning new maths? Um, and how quickly are you learning new maths? Because, it, I mean, most students, all students, all students have some gaps 
Um, and if we're going to fill them without staying behind, uh, then we need that growth rate to be above 100% because it's calibrated such that 100% is on track to learn one year's maths this year. Um, and so what, what we're doing is by having, by having an average around 1.5 for students or 150% um, is we're catching up. It's a long game in, in all schools. You know, students come in sometimes many years behind what, what they should be expected of for their age. Um, but it's a game that the schools are winning at the moment, which is really exciting. Um, and of course that takes that takes time for schools, you know, in the beginning, I'm not going to say first day, they're going to be getting 150% growth rates. It's, it's an ongoing process. It's a very different way of teaching for a, for, a, for a teacher and learning for a student, particularly in the teacher's efforts. So no longer focused at the front of the room, deciding what everyone's going to learn today, but instead focusing on small groups, which their data that they have access to tells them are ready for the right thing right now, or small groups who, who maybe aren't getting above 100% as their growth rate. It's like, all right, you know, you're a bit behind, and currently your growth rate is... 85%. We're not, we're not bridging that gap, but we can. And I've got access to that, and I can plan my interventions, interventions around. Um, those are all the things that I kind of really make sure I say before I let anybody get in. So at this point, I'm happy for people to ask questions. I know I haven't covered it all. I couldn't, even though I kind of just went at it, you know, in incomparable speed of Robin Williams. Um, but questions, anybody? <coughs> All comments from, from the teachers so far. I know that, actually, before I have questions, I know that in this case, um, the school's planning to, to start using Math Pathway next term. Teachers have gone through some training and, and look, been looking at it. Um, uh, but currently, all there is is that first step of, of diagnostic information. So we're, we're learning what students do and don't know, so they hit the ground running at the beginning of next term. Um, so just, just to give a picture of what's going on there. Questions? No? What other schools oh. in the area use this? Ah, so in the area there's Ararat Secondary College, um, Stall Secondary College, nobody in Ballarat yet, um, Warwick the Beale Secondary College as we head up there, uh, and then I'm, I'm from Colac originally, so I'll kind of picture all of Western Victoria as the area, but that's not really the area. But down in Warrnambool there are a number of schools using it as well, um, over towards Bendigo, actually almost every school in Bendigo. Um, yeah, quite, quite a few. So is it only a high school um, program or is it used in primary schools? It is used in primary schools. As we use, we work in grades 5 through 10. Uh, yeah. And that's because there's a, a, kind of a, a level of self-efficacy that's required <laughs> of students. And we help to build it, but it's, it's really beyond students who are younger than 10 in general. Um, but the majority of the schools using Mass Pathway are secondary schools. Which, I mean, you can imagine uh, four out of those six available year levels fall in secondary schools. So yeah. you can expect more of those, those schools to be looking at it. So it's accessed on iPad or computer? Yeah, so it's, it's online. So anything um, with internet access and an up-to-date browser, scratch that, not a smartphone, it's too small. Um, but anything with an up-to-date browser, so there are iPad schools, BYOD schools, um, Lydian and Lenovo schools, Surface Pro schools, if, whatever it is. And it doesn't have to be the same device in the classroom and at home either. It's an online account that you can log into anyway, and that's, that's what students do. So the teachers put in what subjects they want covered for that year. I imagine that's the curriculum for the state. They can, yes. Yeah, they can, or it's just yeah, that's just what. And uh, not, not actually the what the majority of schools do. So the, um, what what the majority of schools do is uh, allow kind of the the students and their choice the choice restricted by what they are what they're actually capable of doing um, decide what they'll do. So there's it's not necessarily that they'll cover these seven items this term or anything. It's the student will learn what they're ready for this term. Um, and it's all aligned, of course, to the Australian curriculum. But the fact that a student is 14 doesn't necessarily mean that they'll always be working on grade eight work, if that makes sense. So, uh, yeah. would a student be, like, as a class, would they be working on, like, say, percentage, or does that, will they be all working on that particular topic? Again, the answer is that they can. Uh, they're kind of what I call the purest module, pu purest, P-U-R-I-S-T, not most pure, purest module, uh, sorry, purest method of maths pathway uh, is what we kind of call in the office over the slab, which is the students have access to the entirety of the curriculum and whatever they're ready for, they can choose to work on that. Having said that, the teacher has the ability to constrain that choice to, say, percentages, or to, but they'll get the percentages work that is right for them. Um, and I don't, I don't even mean 
easy, medium, hard versions of grade eight percentages, for example. I mean, you know, if a student is ready for grade three percentages, if that exists, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if percentages exist that low in the curriculum, um, that's what they'll, they'll work on. And if they need to have good, um, just whole number sense before they can understand percentages, they'll work on that It's a necessary prerequisite to be able to do percentage work. So how the, oh, sorry, I'll come back. We'll go over here first. Oh, sorry. Um, what data or internet are we going to need at home because we're out of town? And, yeah. yeah, so you're worried about not having enough bandwidth. Is it, is that yeah. It? yeah, yeah. So very little, really. So um, at the moment, this student's page is loaded. Uh, and, and I mean, not as, like, in the way that a account or a question is. Um, but in, uh, in terms of it's, it's loaded up. And no more information is is fed into the system. A student picks what they're going to work on, it's loaded once, and that's it. They work in their, in their book uh, in the same way that they have in a traditional classroom, you know, on, on paper, with paper and pen. Um, and there's no input of answers into this until test time, which is always run in class, a test. Um, so it may, if you've got a slower internet connection, take a little bit longer to load, but once it's up, it's there. Uh, and there's no need to be constantly uploading your answers or be constantly downloading new questions. A whole piece of work loads as one. That makes sense. I'll show you a piece of work. We'll see what this student is working on. They can have a look at and we call a piece of work a modular. Again, arbitrary choice. Use my hotspots, so let's see. Oh no, it's alright. It's logged out. <laughs> that was probably because I sat there for a while. This is part of what the teacher side looks like. That tab, I mean this tab. Students, back into Ethan. Module. So he's looking at working on back-to-back histograms. It's gonna take a moment to load. And it's just a PDF. Um, and the way the way that it's structured is essentially one question out of a textbook, you can think of it as very, very carefully scaffolded and guided. So we know, because we've diagnosed Ethan here on what he can and can't do, that he can do question one. We've, we wouldn't give him this piece of work. You wouldn't be able to choose it if that wasn't true. Um, this is the way all the work is constructed and designed. Um, and he kind of gradually builds himself uh, the knowledge that takes him to whatever the last question on the piece of work is. But it all loaded at once when he opened this module. And he has no need to put his answers in here at all. The way that he confirms that he's done the work it's just by clicking on this button, which says, I can do this now, put it on my test. Every student's test being different is actually constructed by them, which puts ownership on students. Um, and I know people are going to say they're just going to put it all on their test right away. They, they might try to get them not to in the very beginning, um, but they very soon, soon realise that that results in doing the same work a whole lot of times, which no one wants to do. So when they answer the question, mm. do they have access to the answer? They do. I just have to scroll down um, and we have a an answers section, which anything that's green highlighted is an answer. Um, so, it's, and it, again, it's, it's like having the right question very carefully guided out of a textbook um, with fully worked answers and things like that. As well as that, students have access um, to a section that says, I need help with this, um, which every single piece of work has a video that goes with it, which is just um, somebody, it's just a whiteboard capture of somebody doing one of the trickier questions um, and explaining what they're doing. It's nothing all that flashy, but it's useful. Um, and when they're in class, uh, the ability to find out who in the classroom is also working on this, or who also already knows how to do this, so that the students can work collaboratively, and you know, we're not trying to, there's a lot of individualized learning behind this. Uh, we don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater and lose you know, student mathematical discourse and, and group working. And the teacher's aim is, is very much to encourage that part of it, uh, but we put prompts where we can. Yes? How do we go with a teenager that's being lazy and that's where the teacher's skills come in, in general. Yeah, and I mean, that says a lot to just, oh, you have to figure that out. Um, but that is something teachers are, are experienced with and very good at, and we, we put a lot of work. And what we do with them is help them to identify that from the data side. Uh, they, they have uh, kind of measurements on who's doing how much work, uh, who's doing a lot of work, maybe not getting it right on their tests, meaning they're probably not actually doing it very well. Uh, you know, who's getting everything right on the tests, but not putting much on their tests, and thus not making as much progress as they could. They have access to see who should I intervene with for a reason. Um, and teachers know their students and, and make those calls in other ways as well. Any other questions? Yes. Um, I'm just wondering, 
Any other questions? How about your street argument? Mm, so that is all online, which it does need to be on with a you know, stable, not insanely strong internet connection. So in the in the first instance, um, students all do this at the same time, and, and you would have already been through some of this stuff. Um, there is a whole whole kind of subsection of Math Pathways devoted to, to diagnosing students. And we ask them very careful questions uh, and off that determine whether they can or can't do things. And every student would get the same first question. Um, I think it's generally something about times tables. And whether they get it right or wrong determines what their next question will be. Because if a student perhaps doesn't know their time tables, we're not going to ask them what 31 times 415 is, because they won't be able to do that either, right? Um, and similarly, if a student could answer that question, we wouldn't ask them their timetables. Um, so the way that's done is, is all online. So it's just the, the diagnostic and the fortnightly tests that have actually online data entry from the students. The rest of it is all on paper in your book. And during those tests, they should have access to paper generally to be able to do their working out, just no calculators. There's quite a small number of questions from the teacher. So. <laughs> Hopefully I've just answered them all. Yes, good. My favourite. If you're saying that they can gain a year and a half in a year, mm. so that means by the time they're in year 12, these kids that are going into year 7 should be like third year. Mm. They should if they're starting at 7.0. Oh, sorry, 6.0 is where you start. The, where you should start at the start of year 7, you know, end of year 6. Um, the, from what we've got from the schools that are using Math Pathway so far, uh, the average entry point, and we have kind of very strict mastery level way of determining a student what a student can and can't do. There's kind of no half about it. It's, you know this or you don't. Um, the standard student comes in somewhere towards, I'd say, the early to mid grade four stage. And so most students are coming in a couple of years behind. So learning a year and a half uh, over the four years that they will use Math Pathway, because it's, it's only up to year 10. BCE, every student in the States is the same test, and we can't fiddle with that kettle of fish. Um, but, yeah, the, the goal is to have students finishing all of the content before they, either before they go into BCE or, or even earlier. And we do have some of the schools that have been using Math Pathway the longest do have this, this problem. It's a very good problem uh, to have, which is students in year nine completing all the, all the Australian curriculum up to year 10. Um, I'm not saying it's all the students. But they're developing new classes for this kind of subset of students, uh, generally around engagement in mathematics rather than extending. Uh, but also, we'll, we're constantly adding to what we have. So we'll be including 10A, Year 11 and Year 12 content as we go, because just because a student got to the end of Year 10, why should they stop this? I mean, if they want to get exposed to Year 11 and 12 maths early and then just breeze through VCU, they, they should be able to. Um, but again, like, we're, like I said before, when we just celebrated our third birthday, it's an ongoing process. We've got all of the non VC curriculum so far, and VC is the next step. Sorry, so with this, there'll be no workbooks as such, like all their learning stuff will be online, and so therefore their test questions, everything will be uh, online? So, no, not quite. Not quite. Uh, so there will be no, no workbook. Uh, well, no, no, there will be a workbook, there won't, wouldn't be a textbook, uh, because you know, with a textbook, everybody turns to the same page and, and does you know, left hand side of question one or something like that. Um, but instead, students are presented with the right work for them online and completed on paper with a pen. Um, and when they have their fortnightly tests, there is some of it online. Anything that could be assessed with, you know, what is the answer to this multiplication, you just put that number in the computer. But any, any questions that something like draw an example of a square pyramid or show you're working, those are actually <coughs> put on paper. Um, and the system determines what questions to put on the paper test for that student. And the teacher marks that part things about show you're working. So, I mean, if we could have, we probably would have put as much online as, as like, everything, uh, because that just reduces the amount of teacher marking, more kind of admin work. Uh, but when there are questions that are subjective like that, they go to the teacher's call. If um, a person, like, if they have trouble visualising on a computer and they work better at a paper book, is that available? Yeah, I mean, it's just a PDF, so you can print it. Print it out? Yeah, yeah. And that also helps people who didn't have internet at home. You could print it out at school before you went home as well. Um, that's not something that we built in. It's just, it's a PDF that people can print them. Yeah. <laughs> it was quite a hand of ice. So if you've got a student that's struggling, mm -hmm. are the questions unlimited? Like, or is it, if they are still continually to struggle on a topic, 
Mm. Is that when the teacher has to intervene and find other ways of getting the message across? Yeah, the teacher would intervene at that point. And so that's kind of the, the last step in this I need help. Uh, we do a lot of work and teachers continue to do a lot of work, which is also kind of scaffolded on the teacher side, um, in getting students to realise when they're, when they're stuck and what they're stuck on, uh, which is quite a complex skill that can definitely be learned. Um, otherwise, it does, if, if none of these things are, that we provide help, then it does come to the teacher to make sure that they'll be able to demonstrate that they understand it on the test. Uh, but really, if a student is behind, like the sky is the limit, it is unlimited, like you said. Um, yeah, and that's, that's what engage, the feedback that we've got is that what's most engaging for students, whether they have previously been high achievers or, or um, you know, students who really struggled with maths, is that the feeling of success comes from accessible work. <coughs> not, not realizing where you are kind of as a level, as a number, but knowing that, oh, this is work I can do, and I can get a lot of it done, and I can get myself a rocket as the, as the icon. Um, it's, the rocket was a last minute addition. It's proven so useful. <laughs> I'm really glad we did it. There was a hand over here, sorry, a second ago. Um, no? Oh, great. Oh yes, of course. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So our, our role is certainly not to replace teachers in, in any way. And that's a common early kind of what Math Pathway looks like. Um, the idea is to um, shift the teacher's role from one where they, where they have control over what everybody learns to one where they have control over who they have the most impact with today. Uh, so the teacher essentially spends almost no time at the start of a lesson at the start of a whiteboard and immediately starts circulating and picking on small groups, picking, on, picking out small groups and individuals to work with, doing what most people say is kind of the better part of teaching, what teachers kind of like to do better, have more of those aha moments for students. Yes? Do they, will they still have practice tests for the test? So they have methods for revision, but not a practice test, which is something we've had some feedback about and looking at building at the moment. Essentially, it would require us making extra copies of every single test question that exists so they don't get the same one. So it's a very big job, but we have got feedback saying it would be useful, so it's in the backlog at the moment. But there are other methods for, um, if I go back from here to the home section, which is back here, there's a little section called what will be on my test, which shows me everything that I've put on my test so far, so I can go back over it. And teachers often have their own kind of um, mechanics for making sure students are prepared for test making a summary sheet or, you know, quick pop quiz, orally, can you explain this topic to me? Um, that, that's really still, still very subjective, but as we find out more and more from teachers using it, what works best, we just try to build it in. That's kind of how all of math public exists. People told us what works best, and so we built it as best we could. Stop doing things by hand, effectively, it makes much of time. <laughs> if the kids have oh, yes. um, said that they put this on my test and they mm. mastered it, and when it comes to the test time and they don't get that question right, mm. so does that go back on their, um, their next stage of learning? Yes, so the teacher has access to the information that that's happened, obviously, um, but also that becomes available for them to select again, uh, because we, we, they won't be able to do the pieces of work that would follow on from that, because they haven't demonstrated that they understand the prerequisite that comes before it. Uh, and the next time they see it, there's more scaffolding. Um, the, the work that they see is the same, uh, but the scaffolding is around, all right, this time, are you checking your answers as you go? Are you... This very common thing that students do, and that I used to do a lot, was I'd answer all the questions 1A through D, 2A through F, uh, and then I'll go back and mark it, and I'll go tick, cross, 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 tick, cr and then I'll just move on. Clearly all those crosses mean I did not understand questions 1 and 2, um, but I just kept going anyway. So there's more, more scaffolding around that kind of stuff the second time they come across it. And if it keeps happening, the teacher is kind of red flag on their side, say, this, this keeps happening for this student now. And it's worth noting they do get different questions when they get tested on it again the next time so they can't memorise essentially the same questions with you know, numbers changed and people's names changed and things like that. But yeah. So as a parent, you've just got to go by the little, um, what did you call it? The, the rocket. The little rocket. The little rocket. If your kid's up to the levels of their year level. 
Uh, so no, that actually is a, is a measure of how much progress they're making. Um, if you want to know about student levels, the best way to do that is to talk to the teacher about it. Um, because the whole, the emphasis on the student side is all about growth. And so we don't highlight, level. we try to avoid talking about levels as much as we can there. Um, but that information is, of course, I mean, it's required for reporting by, you know, Victorian legislation. So of course teachers have, have access to what students calculate the level is. Um, and you best to talk to teachers about that. Yeah, there is. Currently it's quite bare bones, but I'll point out where it is, because it's the thing we're working on right now. So it's the thing that in the coming weeks will look very different. So there's a little button, um, like I said before, students can log in anywhere that they've got an internet connection. Um, and teachers have a way of distributing student accounts to parents as well, or just if your student knows their username and password, you know, log in with them at home and get them to explain things to you. I know student mail is quite unreliable, but you know, keep persist. Uh, <laughs> uh, and once they log in, all the same, like all the information that's relevant to them is relevant to you as well. Um, but there's a little section here called parents, and students can access it. There's no, there's no sensitive information. But it summarises things quite well, and you can even put in your details so that you'll get um, an email or maybe even an SMS. I'm not sure uh, about when a test has been finished, and, and it's time to log in and have a look at how that test went. You know, you can sign up for these kind of, kinds of interactions. Um, but also, this student is, is this kind of mock students is not here. Have information on how they're doing, um, what students are doing, similar work. Uh, as one of the things that we will be adding really soon, actually, which I, I just think is really neat is uh, given the work that your student is doing now, what's a good question you could ask them along car trip or over the dinner table or something that would prompt what they're already doing. So um, I just think that's nifty, because I think dinner, dinner time mathematic conversations are cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the minority, aren't I? Yeah. <laughs> oh, Joel, you're the worst. Um, but yeah, so at the moment, this is the thing that we're working on. As you can see, it's, it's, it doesn't look great. I'm not particularly happy with it. Um, but this is the thing that we're jazzing up and we've got feedback that is kind of the next priority that we should be doing. Um, so the thing that we just completed was making a report, essentially the best report building thing that we've ever seen, so hopefully teachers agree that it's really good. Um, and now it's the parent portal. So give it a few weeks, or, or should be by the start of the next term, and this will look very different, much flashier, and have kind of everything in one page uh, in kind of parent friendly speak. You don't have to be an educational expert to understand everything that's going on on the page. There's the idea behind. No. Can you put on the parent portal where the level is at? Where the level is? Yeah. I can, yeah. Well, I can, I, can, mm. I can write that down. I can't promise it'll be done. It all depends on the feedback we get from everybody else as well. Give me one second. Can you remember that and get me to write it down before I go? <laughs> I don't want to stop and just everyone watch me write something down really slow. Good. With a big hook hand. Any other questions? I'm happy to hang around as well, um, and if people want to ask questions that might be relevant to the whole room, um, I mean, I'm, yeah, I've got heaps of time, I'm going to Blue Duck later, so that's, <laughs> so I'm staying the night, so I, yeah. Um, I can feel kind of what the, the common approach is for schools there, um, which is, it's a very big change. Uh, and trying to, we used to kind of let schools try to jump in the deep end. Uh, and there's a school in Wanamal that went, it's a very big school that went seven through 10 the first day. And oh my God, did they have a bad time. They're, it's just too much change to do it all at once. Uh, so what schools do instead is start with a cohort. Um, and because we can keep that data with the student as they move through the school, uh, they just, there's a first cohort that uses math pathway, and as they move up, uh, so if, if it was deemed successful and, and it was going well for your school after this, after this term of use, uh, then next year it will be sevens and eights, and after that, sevens, eights, nines. Because it's particularly if you've got students in year nine and 10 who have been taught a very different way for a few years, and then get into this, it's, it's much harder, whereas in year seven, it's much easier from, from that perspective. So hand over here, and then over here. Yeah, now, you say there'll be no year eight, there's models again. Um, I've got a daughter who's 
team will weigh in on next year. Mm -hmm. But her maths abilities are that of maybe what coming in, what will be coming in year seven. Mm -hmm. Will that child be able to make use of this? Also, ind individual bases would come under the discretion of the school and of maths pathway, and I couldn't speak for whether whether that could be done, and it's very difficult for a teacher to have a classroom where a handful of students are doing something different. Um, but I wouldn't write it off either. So I'd come and talk to me afterwards and involve the teachers as well on how that's possible, if you think it would be beneficial. But sometimes for, for parents and teachers as well, when you get into year nine and 10, you start thinking about, all right, is it more important this, at this stage to get ready for VCE in the short amount of time we have left? Like it really depends on what would be the most valuable thing for you. Was it a daughter or something you said, sorry, a daughter? Um, from, from kind of the start of the experience. Um, and there was, yes, over here. Oh, I was just, um, this question, I'm not sure if it's relevant or if it's a silly question, but um, it's been a long time since I've been at school. Um, and I was just wondering, what are the sort of like Yeah, so in, in um, 7 through 10 uh, maths, there is no prescribed business maths, um, no. which is which are now general maths, um, those kinds of things. Yes. Um, but that still exists in VCE, obviously, because okay. those are determined mm -hmm. by, by Victorian uh, yes. curriculum. Uh, but what what we're aiming to do here is both increase the number of students who are, who are able to access you know, the, the higher you know, methods and specialist maths, yes. but also know really, really well what is the best math, best maths come easy for a student because we have really granular data on exactly what they do and don't know. So when it comes time for them to leave year 10, we can really accurately say, this is the right maths for you. And we even have um, on the teacher side the ability to project, all right, given your current level and how much progress you're making, by the end of year 10, you would probably be suited to this maths. You can, I mean, you can tell that year 7, but if you, if that growth rate goes up or goes down over the coming few years, that'll, that'll change, obviously. But it's, it's also a good way to, if you, if a student wants to be able to do, say, methods come the end of year 10, they need to achieve this growth rate for the next, you know, on average for the next four years. Kind of thing. For some students, that'll be, maybe they're quite close, and that'll be, you know, 110%, but others it might be consistently 200%. But that's an achievable number with not an outrageous <laughs> amount of work, just about not wasting your time by doing work with, and not understanding it. So about making sure you understand things come across. I won't hold everyone up if, if we don't have more questions. I'm aware that there are some people who probably opted for a late dinner, so I'll <laughs> go on. And when, you, when the student has completed their module, whatever they're working on, and they have a test, mm -hmm. so it'll be individual tests, like that person will sit that test, we are just keep working, is that how that... Ah, good question. So they all do the test at the same time. Uh, the, the, the test is generated for a class at once, okay. um, but everybody's is different because it depends on the work they were doing up to, up to the day of the test. Um, it's much easier from a kind of logistical standpoint for the teacher to have a test date, mm. but everybody's doing different work. Um, and they don't have to all get through the same amount of work by a test date either. How much they got through, that's what is on the test. Just, uh, some students with shorter tests, some longer tests. Some who may have been unwell and didn't do anything up in the lab to that test. They won't have one, they'll just work as normal. It's all just going. So do they catch up then if they've been sick for that particular test? Do they have Yeah, to... anything that if a student misses a test but there was there was going to be a test for them but they, but they weren't there for it, um, it just gets rolled on to the next test. And so the average over the two <laughs> semester you know, they'll get a zero for the one they missed and double the score for the one the next one, the shooting assuming that they work at the same rate over that those two fortnights, um, and then the kind of at the end of a term of semester, the number you care about is the average, so it, it's not effective. So how often do they sort of have those tests, roughly, or is that determined? Every fortnight. Every yeah. couple of weeks. Yeah, yeah. So essentially, the, the only rules that we have on tests is there are 16 a year, which is roughly one every fortnight, with room for camps, swimming sports, things like things like that. Uh, so it's a bit less than one every two weeks, and it can't be closer than a week together. Um, there's not enough time to get kind of and make very much work. Um, so those those are the only, and so teachers, they're every two weeks, but you can. You can remember a couple of days it was going to be athletics day on that day or something like that. It's very, very malleable. Again, feedback. They never used to be, people complain. So. Yeah.
do a lot at home, or is it a personal choice, or is it teacher initiated to how much? It's different everywhere. So it, it is, I would say, generally it's the, the choice of the teacher, whether the teacher wants people doing this many plus, and they tend to not measure it on time, but maybe so many before the test, uh, plus one more at home. Uh, you know, whenever you do that, it's fine. Um, but in class, actually it's a good question that I didn't, didn't allude to, um, students would spend uh, between 60 and 80% of their time doing this kind of individualised work, which is effectively building a toolkit of mathematical skills, and the rest of the time working uh, kind of whole class, rich activities, you know, projects, things like that. Uh, yeah, because this is, this is really good at building a toolkit, but it's not so application focused, which is what essentially we're trying to enable teachers the extra time to be able to plan uh, those kinds of, again, really fun parts of being a teacher, running whole class activities that are kind of broad sweeps open-ended, you don't have to be uh, a genius to be able to access them, nor do you, nor would you get bored if you were kind of activities. Um, so to read in a really roundabout way, I've answered your question by saying, class time is enough for, for students to do really well, but you know, some schools have a real focus on homework, and they can, because they can log in anyway, they can do homework. It's, yeah, it's really fine. Um, year 10 is halfway through, and you've been working with students go back to Mathematics? Well, maybe by the time the Year 7 students uh, here got to the end of Year 10, we'd have found a way to kind of break the VCE system. That's our long-term aim. I'm not going to make any promises on that, obviously. Uh, but we do have a couple of schools, some of our earliest adopters, who are, who are thinking about that right now. You know, they've been using it for a few years, students in Year 10 now using that pathway. Um, and to, to put it bluntly, they're not worried, because what, what they've got is a whole cohort of students who are actually really, really capable and, and have really solid foundations in maths. Um, and so the fact that they'll have to move back to a more traditional learning model um, doesn't praise them so much because they know that what they, what they do go back to explaining to them on the board, they'll be able to access because we've filled in gaps and we've placed students very, very carefully in the right maths for them because we have the data to do it. Um, so I, I would say give it four years and I reckon we might have weaseled our way into year 11 and 12. <laughs> our long term goal is to force the VCE to have to write more careful exams to differentiate students because they'll be so good. But we'll see. If, if the kids are loving it, can they just work on it at home? Yeah, please, and they yeah, should, absolutely. So again, they just log in and they do the work in their book, and once they feel like they understand it, they can put on their test themselves. So yeah, they can they can do it anywhere. So there's a um, some of our teachers have a, like a forum page, um, and one of them shared a picture of a student. I think he's up in Noosa or something, and he's got his laptop out and he's doing this pathway. I'm sure his parents made him do that. But it's still very exciting. <laughs> I realise I look over that way a lot, so I'll enjoy this. Any questions over here? So I have questions that I need to answer. Once I've worked through a module, is there maybe like, um, say, a challenge of the module? So they really see whether they, what they think they know is really what they know? Or mm. So there's not, but again, feedback tells us that that's something that would be really useful. Um, but that's also part of why the tests are so frequent. Because if, if that has happened, if they think they've understood it and they haven't, pick it up much quicker than, you know, traditional maths unit is six, eight weeks long, right? It's, it's so long ago that that first week happened. Um, here it's only a week ago that that first week finished and we can go back and catch it. So I mean, hopefully we can shorten that gap even further by having things like that. But uh, at the moment, teachers are really happy that they can pick it up, you know, at maximum two weeks after it happened. Yes? Are they ever retested on all the topic? Like they do this tested on that, do this tested on that, but they ever tested like six months at the end of the year? Space practice. No, but they will be. That's, again, like that is something we no one really asked about until the start of this year, and now everybody's asking about it. I don't really know what happened, but essentially the plan is from the start of next year, so we'll build it for, through this year. I shouldn't, don't quote me on this, things change, right? Um, but the, the idea is that uh, at the start of each year or semester, a school could potentially run a kind of revision diagnostic, retest all the things that they newly showed mastery of over in the last six months, 12 months, check it. And if it's no longer there, kind of un, you get a little gold trophy on a, on a module when you show that you've mastered it, turn it back to a target that you can access again if it's, if it's no longer there. So space provision is, from a like, programming technical standpoint, very complicated, but we'll get there. So is it a secret school, sorry? Um, well, super valid first, yeah. Okay. Um, how would the year 10s do exams? 
Mm. So exams are really, they're not a good fit with math Papa, as, as you can kind of picture. So there are still schools doing exams, and we, and we actually have a functionality that allows our schools to, to generate an exam that has multiple entry and exit points, so they can kind of construct it out of different sections of the Australian curriculum, not just sideways across strands, but also vertically across, across year levels. Um, but in saying that, uh, the main reason that they're doing it is to make sure students have, have practiced at you know, extended periods of focus, you know, being able to sit and do the one test for three hours, as they might have to do come BCE. Um, the idea is not to measure everybody against the same standpoint, because that, as, as you probably get, kind of flies in the face of everything that we're, we're trying to do here. And we've found that schools that, um, schools that put a lot of value on a one-size-fits-all exam in, at the same, while at the same time using Math Pathway and do a lot of, kind of growth mindset work that, that students have, have developed in the meantime. Um, so as long as that exam is accessible for everybody, which we have created something that makes it possible, um, then it's doable. But it's not actually something that we recommend. But again, school by school, right? If they, if they want to do it, I'm not going to tell them not to, they're the teachers. Oh yes, there was a question over yeah, here. Yeah, how, how much cha like change from the teachers, like this new method? <clears throat> like we've had training and that. Like how much is involved with the training for them to learn for this? Oh, so uh, it takes the most schools to get in what what I would consider a, a good routine. To, you know, a point where they feel really comfortable, and, and this is kind of now the way they teach and they know what they're doing and can walk into the classroom and just do it. Um, in between term and a semester, I would say, and we facilitate that with. Uh, kind of initial PD training that the teachers do, um, and then built into, you know, we've seen a lot of the student side stuff, there's a whole other thing that's the teacher side of all, you know, all the data, um, but also includes a lot of best practices recorded by other teachers. Uh, essentially, people were getting, some teachers were getting really good results, so we went out and we talked to them and we filmed them talking about the good things that they're doing, and we put it on the teacher side so that they can access what everybody else is doing and find those best practices. Um, so. We've done a lot of work to minimise how much change it is, how, how different it is. The biggest change is in, in a teacher or a school valuing this different way of teaching. That's really the only thing that, that ever stops it taking off in a school, is people feeling like it's not a good fit for them, um, as opposed to it is, but it's too much work. Which is something that we, you know, when we said we let schools jump in 7 through 10 at the beginning, they would say, no, it's too much work. And that doesn't have many more because we don't let people give themselves too much work. Yes? Do you see this sort of coming, this change happening, I guess, um, like I think it'd be great if all schools adopted this so that it becomes more uniform, whereas if you're changing to another school, like how do you overcome the changes, that would be, mm. I can see that would be... A bit of a problem, yeah, a great aim of ours is for whether it's maths pathway that does it or not, for this to just be the way maths is taught. Maths has a kind of a uniqueness in a really um, hierarchical prerequisite structure that, that does make uh, all everybody accessing the same activity at the same time really difficult. Um, I mean, it's true in, in all subjects, but you know, maybe a writing task, regardless of your ability level, you, you can access, you can do it, but um, you know, adding fractions of different denominators is that the same is not true. Uh, you can't just do it if you're really good at fractions or if you're not very good. If you know what a fraction is, you're not going to be able to add them with different denominators unless you follow a recipe effectively. So I've got enough track there. Is that, um, yeah, the aim is that everyone will be able to do this. And as students move to schools, uh, when they move between maths pathway schools, their data goes with them, which has been really handy. Uh, but by and large, momentum is gathering. And people are realizing whether it's us, whether it's maths pathway that makes it happen, I think this is the way that maths teaching is going to go. Effectively, a lot of people have wanted to do it for a long time, but haven't been able to without bags under their eyes. Uh, it's just not, not um, sustainable for most students. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Yeah, I think it's pretty irrelevant to here, but why do you think no one um, from Ballarat is taking it on? Uh, it tends, it's not really so much that no one from Ballarat is, has, is taking it on. It's more that no one's been the flagship there yet, which is what which I, I mentioned before in passing that uh, you know almost every secondary school in, in Bendigo is doing, and that's because one started and people saw the improved results in mathematics there, and they all kind of bandwagoned effectively, um, and nobody's taken the plunge there yet, and kind of 
as we get go through more rural centres, like the same is starting to happen in Warrnambool and Shepparton. There've been a couple of schools that have been willing to be kind of the guinea pigs there, and the others are all seeing it and, and shifting as well. And so I wouldn't think it would take too long for it to happen there eventually. I, I can't think of a, a reason that those schools are different to all other schools. But that would be the reason. No, I'm happy to. I'll hang around for individual questions if people want. I won't hold you any longer though. Um, is it, did uh, anybody from the school want to say anything before? Oh, yeah, right. Thank you all. Um, especially for you, Dom. Oh, that's fine. Um, I like it. Lovely area. So please, you can come on board. Um, thank you all for coming as well, and I really appreciate the questions. These are the questions we've had around the table as well. Whenever we try something new, and it's about adjusting to the needs of all students, you know, strugglers, the high end as well, and one teacher to do that in the classroom is just incredibly hard. And we think, well, how do we do this better? And how do we meet the needs of all these students? And, and that one-on-one -on -one providing feedback to you as parents as well. And we're being cautious, and Joel probably knows that, I'm cautious with anything, that we do it well, but we have teachers that are passionate about it, and we have our maths teachers passionate about it. But teachers need to include this too. And this is why cautious, cautious, and I've also spoken to some of the other schools down at Warrnambool and they did go ahead with a number of year levels and their take on it because they've had it in a couple of years. And, and cautiously, we start with, with the year sevens. And, you know, I know even our other teachers in other areas are very excited about it, but again, we, we're cautiously excited. And, and I think that your feedback and your constant input to this, I think, is, is, is the best thing, the best part of it making sure that we, when we go down this path that you are fully informed of where your child is and that we are making those constant adjustments as we go through. So thank you very much. Can we thank Joel? For <laughs>